So let's get started, some information on the university. So because we are a state university, we are a public university. And this is actually a question that we get asked quite a bit. And we are a very big school. So this year we've got about 119,000 students studying here at ASU. Um, so that means we are the largest university in the United States. Uh, we have about 14,000 international students studying with us here at ASU as well. Now, that's a really big number. Um, we have more international students than any other public university in the United States. So um, those 14,000 international students are coming from about 135 different countries. So that means when you're in class and you're, um, and you're, you, when you're in class, you're going to be with students from all over the world. But that 14,000 international students is only about 13% of the university. So even though you are going to be able to take classes with a lot of other international students, you're still going to be getting a very American experience as well. So 13% international is, is, is pretty low. Um, you'll find some schools might have as high as 30, 35% international. Um, so that means you will have to make American friends, learn about American culture, um, practice English every day, um, speak English every day. So, so you still get that really American experience as well. So here at ASU, we have five different campuses. Four of them are in Phoenix, and one of them is in a smaller city called Lake Havasu. Now, we are not a university system. This is not a main campus and satellite campuses or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> I'll cover the, the campuses a little later, but it's important to remember that these are all the same university. So your diploma doesn't say what campus you graduated from. Um, your transcripts don't say what campus you graduated from. So it's all the same school. Very high quality faculty, very high quality students at the university as well. So we've got five Nobel Prize winning prof professors, Pulitzer Prize winners, Guggenheim Fellows, and we're a major producer of Fulbright Scholars as well. So before I jump into some of the rankings, um, one thing I have to mention is that we are ranked number one in innovation in the US, and that's for five years in a row. So that's ahead of Stanford, that's ahead of MIT, and this is, I know it's a little strange. It sounds a little strange. Number one in innovation. What does that actually mean? Um, it is pretty abstract. Um, so I'll explain it a little bit. So um, the way a school is chosen to be number one in innovation is that this is something that's actually peer nominated and peer voted upon. So it's other university presidents, um, provosts, deans, famous faculty that are nominating schools who are the most innovative and then the, and then they will be voted on. And so it's basically schools deciding who in the, here in the US is the most innovative. And this really has to do with a lot of different things here at the university. So um, some of the things that are probably important to you are the opportunities for cross-disciplinary coursework and cross-disciplinary research. Um, I get a lot of questions asking, students asking if I'm studying business, can I take some engineering classes? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And not only for a lot of majors is this encouraged, but a lot of majors is this expected as well. So that's something you'll have access to. It has to do with the way we're running housing. It has to do with the, our partnerships with Amazon and Starbucks and Uber. Um, it has to do with the fact that we're number 10 in the world for patents issued. Um, <clears throat> so really high quality research going on at the university and a lot of really innovative policies and education going on as well. So some of the, I know um, a lot of people will ask about rankings and it's something that um, I'll cover pretty quickly. So here in the US, we're ranked number 53 among public institutions and number 117 overall. Now it's important to remember that this 117 is out of about, there's almost 5,000 universities in the United States. So to be a top 200 school is pretty amazing. Um, it's a very different situation to be ranked 117 in the US than to be ranked 117 in the UK, for example, where they have a lot less schools. So our global ranking is 145. Um, if you kind of want to get a better understanding of where ASU sits, um, I would encourage you for wherever you're at to take a look at maybe some of the um, better schools in your country and take a look at the global ranking and compare that to our our global ranking and you can get a better understanding of kind of where ASU sits 
in terms of in terms of its actual global ranking. <clears throat> so besides overall rankings, another thing we can take a look at is college rankings. So that's something that tends to be a little bit more um, accurate, I think. So um, here at ASU, we've got a lot of different majors. So at the undergraduate level, 350 different majors. At the graduate level, over 200 different programs students can do. And a lot of those are gonna be STEM majors as well, STEM choices. So that means it's gonna carry that three years of OPT rather than just the one year of OPT. Now, it's a huge advantage for students to be able to come to a university that has this many different programs they can choose from. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the idea of changing your major. And this is something that's pretty special in the US, especially compared to a lot of other countries where changing your major is very, very difficult. So um, here in the US, what we, what we found is that on average, the average student will change their major three times before they graduate. That's normal. I changed my major twice, that's normal. Um, additionally, looking at international students in particular, about 65% of international students will change their major. So the chances of you graduating with a different major than what you're applying for is actually higher than if you were graduating with the same major. So if you're going to a school where they might be pretty good in engineering, but you study a little bit of engineering, you realize, you know what, I'd actually really like to do business. But that school doesn't have a business program or doesn't have a very good business program you're gonna to have to end up transferring to a different university, which is an, a whole process. Um, but here at ASU, because we have so many different programs and they're all very good, um, if you do end up deciding to change your major, which again is likely, um, you don't have to transfer universities. You can just change your major to a different major. And that's usually like a five minute process. So even though we have that many different programs here at ASU, um, we're pretty well known for, I think, four main areas. And the first one is gonna be business. So um, business, I'm sure a lot of students are interested in. Engineering also um, is something that we're very good at as well. So art and design, these are really good programs at the university too. Um, this is, will include things like industrial design, um, photography, um, dance, music, these kinds of majors and then public affairs as well. So public affairs will include things like public health, public policy, nonprofit management. Um, so those kinds, of, those kinds of programs here. So finally, we can take a look at the, at the major rankings as well. So at the graduate level, um, got a lot of engineering, a lot of business that are ranked top 20, top 30, top 40. And at the undergraduate level, you'll find a lot of really good programs as well. <clears throat> so one major I always really like to um, promote to international students is our supply chain management majors. So at the undergraduate level, we're ranked number two, and at the graduate level, we're ranked number three. Now, supply chain management is a really hot major. So this is something that we see really good job placement rates, really good job statistics, and high salaries at. And it's a great option for international students. Um, the nature of supply chain, the nature of that business. So when you graduate and you're going to go find jobs, um, a company is not just going to want to see a good academic background and good internship background, but they're going to want to see you the ability to speak multiple languages. They're going to want to see the ability to work with people from different cultural backgrounds. Those are very important. So typically an American student graduating will probably only speak English. Um, but you might speak two, three, maybe even four languages. Um, so typically what we find is going into supply chain, international students tend to be even more competitive than the, um, than the domestic students are. So some of our other rankings that are not, not ranked by US News, um, you'll find a lot of um, the art and design programs that I was mentioning. <clears throat> So what all, what all that means is that ASU is basically top 1% of the world's most prestigious universities. So that's what kind of all those rankings, another way to understand that. Um, so uh, top 100 in the world for research and teaching, um, top 10 in the US for best, best buy. So um, I know a lot of you and your parents wanna get the biggest bang for your buck as far as um, the college that you're, that you're um, attending in the US. So that's something you, that you can rest assured that you'll get here at ASU. 
<clears throat> so a lot of students actually don't know a lot about Arizona as a state. Um, they probably know about California, they know about New York, they might know about Florida, but Arizona tends to not be something that um, a lot, not a lot of people know about. So Arizona is in the Southwest US, um, right next to California. So from Phoenix to get to cities like San Diego, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, the Grand Canyon um, is about a four hour drive. And on a flight, it's like not even one hour, it's like 50 minutes. So it's really easy for students to get together with their friends on Friday night. You can go to Las Vegas, you can go to LA, have some fun for the weekend, come back Sunday night, be in classes on Monday. So really easy to get around and go to different places around the, um, around the Western US. So uh, what you probably do know about Arizona is the climate here. Um, so the climate here is really can be summed up in two words, hot and dry. Um, so that's, that's how it is. Summertime can be really hot here. Um, it can definitely get, get above 40 degrees here, um, but it's not humid. Um, so even though it's hot when you're walking around, you don't kind of get that wet, sticky feeling that you do in a lot of other places. Um, but winter time here is really nice. So here, I live in Tempe. Um, so for me, um, typically like I will open all, all the windows in my house in October and you can leave them open 24 hours a day until, until May. So usually it's not until May that we're starting to turn on the air conditioning and things like that. So um, really beautiful winters here. Um, here in Phoenix, it doesn't snow, so it, it doesn't get below zero. Maybe the coldest it gets is like three or four degrees. Um, so it doesn't get below zero, it doesn't snow here, but you can drive like an hour or two north to Northern Arizona and it does snow there. So if you do wanna go skiing or get some, do some of those wintertime activities, you can still do that even just an hour or two away. So here in Phoenix, um, Phoenix itself is a really big city. So we are the fifth largest city in the United States. <clears throat> so we are bigger than Boston, bigger than Philadelphia, bigger than Seattle, bigger than San Francisco, bigger than Washington DC. So it is a big city. Um, so that means it's got good nightlife, really good food here, um, a lot of fun things to do. So there's no way you could possibly be, be bored here. And it's a great place to study as well. So here in Phoenix, um, the one thing that's really nice too is the cost of living is actually lower than the national average, while salaries tend to be higher than the national average. I don't know why that is, but that is the case. <clears throat> so if you compare Phoenix, for example, with another really big city in the Southwest US, Los Angeles. So if you go study in Los Angeles, um, your rent for one month will probably be like, $1,400, $1,500 for a bedroom. You're sharing your kitchen, you're sharing the living room, you're sharing everything, and you're paying $1,500 per month. For that same price, $1,500, you can come to Phoenix and get your own three bedroom apartment. So three bedrooms, two bathrooms, it's all yours. Um, but if you wanna live together with friends um, and share an apartment, a bedroom here would be like $400 or $500. So really different cost of living compared to Los Angeles for about the same quality of life. Um, and like I said, the food scene here is great. I think our food scene is just as good as Los Angeles's, if not a little bit better. Um, so that means if you wanna go out and have good food from any country in the world, you'd be able to get that. Um, if you wanna go to the store and get things to, to cook things that you wanna cook, um, that's all really easy to buy here. So it is a really big city where it's really easy to live. Um, great place for, for young professionals as well. So um, number 16 in the US for young professionals. So for people starting out, for people going to college and for people starting out their careers, um, it's a great place to start. Um, we've got a great, great economy here, really good jobs, especially if you're going into tech. Um, so what we're finding here in the US is that Actually, a lot of tech companies are leaving California and are leaving um, Seattle, basically are leaving Silicon Valley and are leaving Seattle. And you're finding that most of them are relocating to really two main places. The first one is Phoenix and the second one is Salt Lake City, Utah. So those two places are growing really, really quickly for tech jobs. Um, not just companies leaving, but new companies as well. 
So here in Phoenix, we have also a lot of data centers. So part of the, part of the climate here is that the climate and the weather is really, really stable. Um, we don't have any natural disasters. We don't get earthquakes or hurricanes or blizzards or anything like that. <clears throat> so a lot of companies like to put second headquarters here and data centers here um, because it is so stable and so safe here. And so they can get that reliability that they typically need. And what that means is jobs in those industries as well. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, we have five different campuses and four of them are in Phoenix and one of them is in Lake Havasu. So again, it's the same university. It just depends on your, um, on your major, which campus you're going to study at. But a lot of majors actually are at more than one campus. <clears throat> so some, some, campus, some majors are at every campus. So students can choose which campus they want to study at. It's the same admission requirements regardless of campus, the same tuition generally. Um, so uh, it just depends on your choice. So it is pretty normal for students to take classes at more than one campus. And if that is the case and you choose to do that, um, then you can uh, we provide shuttles that go between all the campuses. So very convenient. They go from six in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. They run every 15 minutes. Um, they're free. They're only for our students. There is Wi-Fi on the buses. So when you go back and forth, you can get online and do your homework. Um, so really convenient for students to be able to get back and forth between all the different campuses. So, um, so quickly, just a reminder, if you have questions, you can answer them in the, you can ask them in the Q&A um, box. So you can type in your questions there and I'll be able to see them. So um, the first campus I wanna talk about is the downtown Phoenix campus. So if you're studying majors like global management, journalism, law, nursing, uh, the public policy programs, public service programs that I mentioned earlier, then you're gonna be at the downtown campus. The downtown campus is very much an urban campus. So um, it's right in the middle of the city um, and it doesn't really have a campus per se. It's more like different buildings that you would walk to. So again, right in the middle of downtown, really good nightlife here. So you can see these two big buildings here. So this building in the back is where our baseball team plays, so our professional baseball team. Um, and so you can go see baseball games here. This is where our NBA basketball team plays. So if you like to watch basketball, you'd be watching them here. Um, there's a lot of concerts and other things that happen here as well. Um, so if you want to go to see concerts, anything like that, then you can do that too. And these are only about 10 minutes from the, from the university. Um, so really easy to be able to um, to be able to get back and to be able to go out and do those. Really cool. This has a rooftop pool here. Um, so this this university or this campus, the gym has a rooftop pool, which is really really cool. <clears throat> We've got the Polytechnic campus. Um, so this is an engineering focused campus. And one thing that's pretty cool as you walk around this campus is there's almost you'll hardly ever see a classroom. It's almost entirely labs. So from, um, so from the very first day, students are doing most of their work in labs, very hands-on education. Um, so so um, really, that's just the style of education here. Um, a lot of companies are putting multi-million dollar machines here for our students to use. So even undergraduate students are using those machines. Um, basically, what they want to do is make sure that um, companies want to make sure that our students can graduate on Friday start working for them on Monday, and they don't have to spend a bunch of money and a bunch of time training up, them up to the latest tools and the latest techniques. Um, they want our students to be able to do that from the very first day. So uh, what that means is really highly qualified graduates that are typically able to get jobs very, very quickly. Another thing that's interesting about this campus is um, it actually has its own airport. So I'm not sure how many schools you've heard of that have their own airport, but we do. And students can use that airport to fly to cities like uh, Seattle, um, Las Vegas, San Francisco. So if you wanna go out and visit those places, you can leave your dorm and walk like five minutes and you're on an airplane. <clears throat> We've got the Tempe campus. Now Tempe campus is our biggest campus and it, um, has a lot of majors here as well. So if you're studying 
a lot of our business majors, you'll be here at the Tempe campus. Um, a lot of our engineering majors are here. Sustainability is here. Um, art and design programs are here. Um, so here's where you would be, um, here's where you would be uh, studying if you're doing these kinds of majors. Now, if you've never been to the Tempe campus, it's really difficult to imagine the scale of the campus. It's a huge campus. Um, we've got about 20 dorms, um, three libraries, uh, four or five cafeterias, so two or three gyms. So it's a really, really big campus. It's like it's its own city. Um, here you can see our football stadium. So when we have games here, this will hold 50,000 students at one time. So this football stadium is the size of some national stadiums. We've got a theater here. Um, this is a really famous, this is designed by a really famous architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and this is one of the few places in the US where you can actually see Broadway shows outside of New York. Um, so the same shows and the same actors that are playing in New York um, will come play here and students can get discount tickets for that as well. So our fourth campus here in Phoenix is the West Campus. So if you're studying a lot of our business programs, global management programs, um, some arts and sciences programs, you'll be here. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned how big the Tempe campus is. So really, some students are looking for a big campus like that. They want that kind of experience, but not every student does. Some students do want kind of a smaller, more intimate um, experience. And that's what they'll find at the West Campus. So this is a lot more like um, a small private school or almost like a liberal arts college kind of feel. Um, so you'll notice that the, the campus here, it's a really, really nice campus. It's a little bit quieter um, than some of the other campuses, um, but really, really nice place to study, really nice place to live, um, if that's the kind of experience that you're looking for. So our last campus is the Lake Havasu campus. <clears throat> and I'll mention this just in case there are any students here that are um, admitted to the Lake Havasu campus. So Lake Havasu campus, um, it's undergraduate only, and it doesn't have engineering, but it does have some really good majors like um, biology, um, business, and um, our tourism and recreation, tourism and recreation management programs that are, um, that are really good here. So the uh, Lake Havasu campus does have a, one of the things that's really special about it is that um, a year of tuition here is only about $10,000. Um, so this, there is lower tuition here at the Lake Havasu campus. Lake Havasu, the city itself, it's a lot smaller than Phoenix, um, but it's a really nice city. It's uh, pretty famous as kind of a vacation city. So a lot of Canadians and a lot of Americans from Northern states will have um, vacation homes here. A lot of golf resorts, a lot of, um, a lot of golf courses, a lot of resorts, things like that. So students doing the tourism and recreation management programs um, do have really good opportunities for internships and jobs once they graduate. <clears throat> and one thing that's kind of interesting too, so I'm sure you can see this bridge here. Um, so I'm sure all of you have heard of London Bridge and probably know the song about London Bridges falling down. Um, so this actually is the London Bridge. So about 20 years ago, a guy went to London, went to the city government and actually bought London Bridge from the city, shipped it back to Arizona brick by brick and rebuilt it here in Lake Havasu. Um, I don't know why, but that is the original London Bridge that's here in Lake Havasu City. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I know right now you're just about to start your university experience. Um, so you might not be thinking about what happens after you graduate, uh, but I'm sure your parents are thinking about it and very quickly you'll be thinking about it as well. So one of the things that we're really proud of here is the job placement rates that we have um, for our students once they graduate. So last year, 90% of our students found jobs within 90 days of graduation, and that includes international students as well. So, um, so that's something that is really important to pay attention to. So according to the Wall Street Journal, ASU is ranked number fifth in the US for producing the best qualified graduates. Basically what they're doing is um, talking to like the 200 largest companies in the US and asking them, for the new graduates that you're hiring, where are you actually, where are they graduating from? So in other words, what universities are producing the students that are getting job offers from you? And for that, ASU is ranked number five in the US. 
So top 16% in the overall for graduate employability. Um, if you're working, interested in working in tech, <clears throat> then ASU is a great place to come. So wow, there's a ranking from Hiring Solve where they were basically asking companies in Silicon Valley what universities are your employees coming from. And ASU was number 10 in the US for people working in Silicon Valley. So that's ahead of UCLA, ahead of Texas A&M, ahead of Purdue, um, ahead of MIT. Um, so if you're interested in working in tech, if you're interested in working in Silicon Valley, then um, ASU is a great place for you to come. Really robust career services as well when you're here. Um, so the university itself has its own career services, but a lot of colleges have their own career services as well. And so they'll be um, setting up career fairs, internship fairs, um, they'll be using a tool called Handshake, which is basically there to introduce students to internship and job opportunities and companies to students. Um, so you can put in a lot of details about what you're studying and what you're interested in working in and um, really drill down to some really small details as far as finding opportunities there. Um, when you talk to students that have had internships, um, and more than half of students do do an internship, um, a lot of times what they're saying is they found them through Handshake rather than through in any other resource. Um, career services is bringing in HR recruiters from companies like Honeywell and Boeing and Apple um, to do mock interviews with students and to help them with their resumes. So the person that actually would be hiring you if you went to a, if you went to a job interview is able to give you <clears throat> specific feedback on your interview skills and um, on your resume. So. And what that means is a lot of resources available to students um, to help them find internships and to help them find jobs. Like I said, um, most students will do internships. Over 50% of students will do internships. Um, so it's important to, and it's a great thing for students to do. So a lot of students ask about jobs on campus as well. And this is something that personally I think is a really good idea. Um, so getting a job on campus, not only does that mean that you'd be able to make a little bit of extra money, but it's a great way to make friends. It's a great way to become a little bit more integrated into the university. Um, so it is a really good experience. So you'll all be studying here as international students on F1 visas. So for students on an F1 visa, you can work up to 20 hours per week on campus. So this is the same at every university in the US. So we're all the same. Um, but because we are the largest university in the United States, with that means a lot of on-campus job opportunities as well. So you might be making coffee in one of the Starbucks that's on campus. Um, you could be working in the library. You could be working as a TA. Um, you could be working in my department. Um, we have a lot of international students working in my department as well. Typically, the average pay for these is about $12 to $15 per hour. Um, so it does help you to make a little bit of extra money um, as you're studying. <clears throat> Here are some of our top employers. Um, so I mentioned before our really strong supply chain management programs. Um, and because of those, you'll find a lot of students going to companies like Amazon, DHL, FedEx, and a lot of airlines as well. <clears throat> so um, so um, uh, Intel is a major employer of ours. We send more engineers to Intel than any other university in the United States. Um, so you go to basically any Intel plant or any Intel office in the world and you'll probably find ASU graduates working there. <clears throat> a lot of questions about OPT. Um, so OPT is something a lot of students uh, choose to do, and um, it's a major draw for students coming to study in the US. So typically you get 12 months of OPT, but there's an extension available for students studying STEM majors um, that would bring it to three years in total. Housing is a question we get a lot of we get, a lot of, we get a lot of questions about housing as well. So um, housing, we do not require international students to live in university housing, um, but if you want to, then we guarantee that you'll have a spot. And um, we expect students to live on, in, in, in on-campus housing. Um, the reality is that it's a great way to get integrated into the university. Um, typically your roommate is going to be the first friend that you make here. Um, so it's, it's a really great, it's a really great idea for students to be living on campus. We do expect them to do that. <clears throat> so this is kind of what a typical dorm looks like. Um, so most um, dorms will have two, two students per room, 
And then between two rooms will be a bathroom that four students will, will use. Um, so even though there's four students per bathroom, typically there's four sinks, four mirrors, four cabinets. So everybody will get their own space, but they'll share that bathroom together. So this is our newest, this is our newest dorm called Tooker House. And this is an engineering specific dorm. So here at ASU, our students live in what we call, call academic, they're, they're, they live together with students um, from similar majors. So engineering students will live together, design students will live together. Um, so your roommate will probably be studying the same major that, as you as well. So this dorm again is engineering specific and it's built basically in order to specifically for engineering students. So you can go to the study rooms and they'll have whiteboards from ceiling to floor. Um, any engineering student will tell you that you'll use these whiteboards a lot um, every, single, every single day. Uh, we have engineering specific tutoring here. Um, so you don't even have to leave your dorm in order to go do tutoring. Um, we'll have make, we have maker spaces here that have laser, laser cutters and 3D printers that students can use in their dorms. Um, it has its own gym, it has its own cafeteria. Um, so really great space for engineering students. And we have housing at every single campus as well. So every single campus is a standalone campus. Um, they all have their own housing, they all have their own libraries, and they all have their own gyms. So everything, so every, camp, every campus has its own facilities. <clears throat> Uh, over 1,500 different clubs that students can join as well. So, um, so we really encourage you to be getting out there and doing something outside of just going to class and studying every day. And um, it's something that I would encourage any student to look into. And really anything that you're interested in, you'll be able to join. So whether it's um, car racing, whether it's hiking, um, we even have a chocolate eating club that students can join. Um, so really anything that you're interested in, um, there will be a club for that, I'm sure. So I'll cover tuition pretty quickly, um, since most of you probably already know about that. So at our four campuses in Phoenix, base tuition for international students is 31,000 per year, plus cost of living and health insurance is about 50, 55,000 per year. Now, of course, this depends on your lifestyle. Um, do you want a car or not? Do you want your own apartment or do you want to live with friends? Are you living on campus or off campus? So all of that will make a little bit of a difference in the cost. And then there's the Lake Havasu campus that I mentioned with tuition at $10,000 per year. So um, most master's programs are gonna be about 26,000 per year, but there are some programs that have some extra fees there as well. So we do have scholarships available as well. <clears throat> so um, for scholarships, what we're looking at is mostly your GPA, your high school GPA and your English scores. So these are the two main things that we're looking at. Um, and uh, at, the un at the undergraduate level, we usually see something between $3,000 to $15,000 um, as a typical scholarship. So um, if you're getting a $15,000 scholarship at the Tempe campus, for example, that's 50% of tuition. We do have scholarships available for the Lake Havasu campus as well. <clears throat> because scholarships at Lake Havasu, because tuition there, is about a third of the cost of the other campuses. Um, <clears throat> scholarships will be about a third of the cost as well. So all of you, as I understand it, are admitted to the university. Um, so there's some important things that you need to know um, that are kind of next steps for, the, um, for, for you. So it's really important to be paying attention to your My ASU. <clears throat> This is really gonna be kind of where you can see what's going on as far as your admission to the university. So what you'll really wanna pay attention to is this priority tasks box. So these are things that you need to take care of <clears throat> um, before you arrive at the university or as you arrive at the university. And the most important thing is gonna to be to pay that enrollment deposit. That's gonna be what you, you have to pay that before you can do anything else. Um, and for those of you that are admitted to fall, um, there's a few things that are really important to be doing. <clears throat> housing is something that you should be applying for um, as early as possible. So housing does tend to fill up and some of the dorms are filling up. So I mentioned the Tooker House for the engineering students. Um, that's already getting pretty full. So you'll wanna be applying for that as early as possible. A math placement test as well. So every student has to take a math, a math placement test. Um, and this is something that you have to do before you're able to register for classes. 
um, students get pretty worried about a test because they think it might affect their admission or something like that, and it does not. Um, there's really no way to fail this test. If you got every answer wrong, all that would do is just place you into the lowest level of math class. Um, so really, this is just a way to determine where your math level is at and what's the appropriate class for you. So you don't want to, you want to take it seriously uh, because you want it to be an accurate assessment of your math skills so that you're placed into the right class. Um, so that's really important to be doing as well. <clears throat> also, applying for I-20s. Um, so I know that in most of the countries around the world, embassies and consulates are closed. Everybody's kind of wondering when they'll be able to get a visa. Um, and what we're expecting is that in different countries, the embassies and consulates are going to open some sooner, some later. Um, but it is important that once those do open, that you have that I-20 in your hand so you are able to go schedule a visa appointment. Um, there probably will be a rush on visa appointments as soon as those do open. Um, so you want to be in a position where you can um, be able to get a, a visa as, as quick as possible in order to make it. So um, I know we had a question about the credit transfer process. So I'll cover that pretty quickly. Um, basically, if you're coming in as a transfer student and you want to transfer credits to the university, um, it's really important to be working closely with your academic advisor through that process. How many credits you can transfer over and what classes they're going to count as is gonna be major by major. So there are, you could transfer credits over and they do count as general credits here at the university, but as far as counting towards your particular course, particular courses you have to take, um, that will be dependent on your major. So you really need to be working closely with your academic advisor on that. There are some important things to keep in mind when you're cr transferring credits over. So you can only transfer over classes that are at least a C minimum. Um, so if you're getting a D or something like that in a class, then that's not going to transfer over. Um, there's also maximum credit hours you can transfer over depending on whether you're coming from a community college or whether you're coming from a four-year university. So there are different requirements there. Also, your credits will be converted to our scale. So our classes are three credits each, and we use the ABCD grading scale. So if you're getting grades that are like out of 100 or out of 120 or out of 40, then those will be, um, then those will be converted to, to our scale. We also have a credit transfer guide as well. So if you just Google ASU credit transfer guide, um, you'll be able to find this. And so what you can actually do is look up the university that you're transferring from and you can take a look at the courses that you've taken and it will tell you what courses those will count at as ASU. At ASU. Um, now just because you don't find a class doesn't mean it won't transfer over. It just might mean that nobody is transferred from that school for that class before. Um, so you'll be the first one doing it. Um, so it'll be the same process for you. So again, um, I can't emphasize this enough, be working with your academic advisor um, if you are a transfer student and you are transferring credits over. <clears throat> so I know we're, we have a lot of questions about um, ASU's response to COVID-19 and kind of how that's changing the application process and how that's changing the visa process and how that's changing um, classes coming up. So, um, so all of you are already admitted to the university, so I won't really cover um, how that's changed the application requirements um, since it won't really affect you as admitted students. So some important things to keep in mind is that we just finished up the spring semester here. So after spring break, the spring semester was entirely online. Um, our summer programs are going to be um, a mixture of digital online classes and some on-campus classes. Um, now by fall, we are expecting classes to be on campus. Um, so um, if you are able to get a visa, then you could join for on-campus classes in the fall. That would be the August intake. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of embassies, a lot of consulates are closed. <clears throat> and so um, we are expecting that a fair amount of students will not be able to get visas in order to make it for the August intake. So if you find that you are not able to get a visa in order to make it for August, um, what you can do is you can start classes digitally, so start your classes online, and then join us on campus as soon as you're able to make it here. So some majors you'll be able to join in September, some in October, some in November, and um, some in January. 
So typically kind of the standard, the standard um, time that we're expecting students to make it will be in January. So that would make your fall semester digital classes. And then once you are able to come on, on campus in January, your spring semester would be here online. And it would be a pretty seamless transition to the, to the, to the on-campus classes. <clears throat> um, but if you are able to make it, a lot of majors are having intakes even sooner than that. So if, for example, your major would have an October intake, that would mean you would only be doing online classes for August, September, so about two months, and then you'd be able to, to join um, <clears throat> your, uh, the on-campus classes. So you would want to be working with your academic advisor if you find that you aren't able to make it for the, for the fall semester for August. <clears throat> now, a lot of students, I'm sure, are wondering what it would be like to be taking online classes. Um, they might be a little bit worried about it. <clears throat> um, so uh, this is something that ASU is really, really well known for and something we're very good at. So ASU itself is ranked number two for online education. Um, and even before all of this started, we already had about 40,000 students studying online as well. So this is not something that's new to us. This is not something that we're just barely getting started on. This is something that we've been doing very well for a long time. Um, so you can rest assured that you'll still be getting a really high quality education um, and still be able to do your lab classes and things like that all online as well. 